This is the Sony ECM B1M microphone, another very catchy product name from Sony. And this is the Rode VideoMic NTG, a surprisingly simple product name from Rode. And I will be using the Sony ECM B1M as much as I can throughout this video. And I'll be sure to put a little thingy on screen whenever I am using the audio from this microphone so that you know it's the audio from this microphone. It is also very windy out here right now. Both of these microphones help deliver great audio and are relatively simple to use. So why would you spend over $100 more to get the Sony B1M? Will the B1 be the one for you? Now this really isn't a direct comparison between the Sony and the Rode, but in this case, the Rode can just stand in for basically any I guess what we can call a traditional video mic, meaning one that connects to your camera through the microphone input and requires its own internal battery. And before we dive too far, I should bring up that there are options like the Rode VideoMic Go 2 and the Deity D4 Duo, small, very affordable microphones that don't require battery power. But while mics like the Go 2 can be a go to source for great audio, they aren't quite the same as these kinds of microphones. And that's because they don't have their own power source. That power is what helps these microphones give better audio quality, and it also lets them have external controls to fine tune your sound. So it's the lack of battery power that makes these microphones not quite as sensitive as the very famous saying goes, with great power comes great sensitivity. But beyond that, here are some of the basic differences between the Rode or a video mic style microphone and the Sony. The Rode, like I said earlier, can work with any camera that has a microphone input because you just connect a cable to it and then this goes to your camera's microphone input. It has its own built-in battery and it does have some manual controls and settings built right into the microphone. The Sony, on the other hand, only works with some specific Sony camera models. And most Sony cameras that have been made at least in the past few years are going to be compatible, but it's definitely important for you to check that your specific camera model is compatible with this microphone before you spend the money on this microphone. But if you do have a compatible camera, then the microphone just connects via the hot shoe on top. And that hot shoe is a cool feature because that's where the microphone gets its power. So there's no cable to attach and there's no battery inside the microphone to charge. It's just being powered from the camera's battery. And in my experience, I haven't seen that have any negative effect on the camera's battery life. It doesn't last like half as long or anything now. But that hot shoe is also a hot button issue because this is the microphone's biggest limiting factor, not just being compatible only with certain Sony cameras, but in order to use it, it has to be mounted directly to your camera's hot shoe. Since the Rode mic and other microphones like this are self-contained in terms of power, you only need the microphone cable connected to your camera's input, which means you can actually run a super long cable. You could connect this to a wireless system, and then you have the flexibility to position this microphone wherever you want it to be. Prior to getting the Sennheiser MKH-50 that I'm running into my FX3 right now, this was my boom mic for several years and I was able to position it just out of frame and then run a long cable directly into my camera. So that's some really cool flexibility that you do not get with this microphone. And that's really what kept me from getting this microphone for so long because the idea of spending so much money on something that had such a limited way of being used just didn't sound like a good idea, no matter how good the microphone sounded. But ultimately, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, it was the simplicity of this microphone that won me over in the end. And a big reason for that is because of these controls that are on the back of the microphone. So control your excitement as I explain what each and every one of these does. And I'm actually going to take off the dead cat windscreen for this, just so that way it's easier to see the controls. Now, if you do use the Sony FX3 or use like that audio extension XLR thingy for like the A7S III and other Sony cameras. This might look very familiar because a lot of the controls that are on this microphone are the same that are on those higher end audio interfaces. So we can start right here at the top. We have this digital and analog switch. Most newer Sony cameras will work with the digital mode, but if you have a camera that's supposed to be compatible with this microphone and it's not working and you have the flip switch to digital, then you can switch it down to analog and that should clear things up. But in general, if you can use digital, do it because it's gonna help you just get a better, higher quality signal. Below that, we have some filter options. We have off, LC, and NC. And off means that there's no filter on the microphone. 
surprising, I know. LC is a low cut filter and NC is a noise cut filter as you will wait NC in some examples right here. So here's a very good example. I'm on the side of our house with the air conditioner going because it's very hot today. So now I'm walking by the air conditioner and it's pretty loud. But now I've switched on the low cut filter and we'll see how that affects that air conditioner sound. So if you're talking next to something like this, that might be a smart thing to do because this is with the low cut filter and this is without the low cut filter. It's also pretty windy out, so this is the microphone without the windscreen and if I turn around, you kind of hear how the wind noise affects the microphone. And now with the windscreen, this is how it affects the microphone in the wind and with everything blowing on it. And this is the wind without the low cut filter, which hasn't been on yet. And now this is the wind with the low cut filter. See if there's any difference there. Here's a great example of cicadas buzzing everywhere in the desert. It's like I'm in an anime. You can probably hear them buzzing. Now I've got the noise cut filter turn on. Are those bugs still bugging you with this audio? Or did the noise filter help quite a bit? And right below that, you do have an audio dial. So this will let you adjust the level of your audio manually, which is absolutely awesome. That is one of my favorite features of the VideoMic NTG is that right on the back of the microphone is a dial that you can turn to dial in the perfect level. Up here we have directional patterns. I forget exactly what Sony calls them, but it's basically a super cardioid, a cardioid, and an omnidirectional pickup pattern. And so this is the super cardioid pickup pattern. I'm right in front of the camera. And if I turn the camera to the side, now you can kind of hear my voice fades out. If I go behind the camera, you can hear me very poorly. And if I go to the other side and now, hello, back around, there we go. If I turn on the regular cardioid pickup pattern, it should sound pretty much the same, but I can get a little more off axis without it losing the sound of my voice as much. If I go to the side, you'll hear it disappear again and from behind the camera and then back in front of the camera. But this could be great if you don't need to really zero in and eliminate other sound as much, especially if you have like two or three people in front of the camera and you wanna get everybody's voice with the microphone, this could be the best setting to use. And there is the omnidirectional pickup pattern, so now I'm in front of the camera, but even as I turn it, you shouldn't hear much of a difference, so I can be behind the camera and point things out, like, whoa, look, it's the Rodecaster Pro, amazing. So what I find myself doing a lot is switching between the directional and omnidirectional patterns quite a bit, because if you're in front of the camera or you're behind the camera filming a sound source in front of it, then you want it picking up this way. But if you wanna quickly just flip this way and now talk from behind the camera and point things out, look at all my notes, my monitor is so tall right now, then you can do that just as easily. And below that is probably the most important switch on this microphone, in my opinion, basically the reason I got it. It is the manual and auto audio level switch. Because this auto feature is so good and the FX3 has it, there have even been times where I've taken my Sennheiser microphone, put it on the FX3 and use that as my like on the go filming setup. And it really wasn't until my friend Peter Lindgren came and visited for a while that I got to see this microphone in action for the first time, see and hear it in action for the first time. That is one hell of a vlog setup though. It's pretty sweet. 24 1.4 G Master. Okay, so that's the one. It's expensive, but it's absolutely worth it. Sennheiser MKH-50, the absolute best boom microphone you could ever have, Sennheiser MKH-50. Peter showed me this right here. You don't have to manually control your audio and it will still work and it will still sound good. One of the best parts about this microphone that I'm using is that I always use auto whenever I'm shooting my videos. I'm only using the shotgun microphone for everything that I do. It sounds so good too is the thing. It's such <laughs> it a does, small freaking right? microphone. I have this, <laughs> Look at that. this that, that whole is thing. big setup. And Peter, somebody who is incredibly skilled with cameras and all about shooting in log and manual everything, he was the one who showed me to just put the microphone in auto because then you can just set it and forget it. And I'm somebody who basically grew up learning that you should never use auto audio levels on a camera because it will always mess things up. They go up and down like crazy. There's a whole bunch of noise. It tends to just kind of ruin your audio. So you set your gain really low and then you use an external microphone to dial in the perfect audio level. But I guess technology has gotten so much 
better, Sony much better, because now you can totally trust the auto audio function. As soon as it's connected to your camera, you don't have to go into any of your camera's audio settings. You just flip this into auto and you're done. When you're using audio, you can still use the filter option. So if you wanna turn on those low cut and noise cut filters, you still can do that. That means if it's windy or something, go ahead and flip on the low cut. And you can still change the pickup pattern and you can still adjust the attenuation as well. So if you pay attenuation, I'll show you an example right now. Right now I have the attenuation set to zero decibels, so this should be good with spoken word. This is how loud I've been talking for the rest of the video through the Sennheiser MKH-50. But the downside is, is that if something happens and I get really loud, wow, this microphone is great, then I might run the risk of clipping the audio signal, and I'm sorry if you're wearing headphones. <laughs> So if I move that to 10 decibels, then that lowers the level a bit, but now pretty much no matter what, and this is kind of what I leave it on a lot of the time, wow, this is amazing! It probably shouldn't ever really clip or peak or have any of those problems. Now, if you are doing something that's really loud, that's when you can switch to the 20 decibel pad, and it's gonna make the level really low, but now if there was instruments and music or some kind of crazy loud car or something happening, now the audio is gonna sound great even though there's a really loud source coming from it. The idea that if I'm in a situation and I don't know what's happening, I can just put this on the minus 10 setting, flip it to audio, and then I'm going to get decent usable audio regardless of the situation. I don't have to worry about making all those dumb mistakes that I normally make a lot is just amazing. So despite its size and the lightweight build, this microphone has a lot of the higher end audio features that you find on Sony's higher end offerings. But still with an MSRP of $360, it is not an inexpensive microphone. So going back to what I said about not wanting to spend that much money on something that was limited to just being attached to the camera and that's it, what I ended up realizing was that for me, recording audio indoors isn't really an issue. I have couple different microphones. I have different mic options if I want to boom out of frame, if I want a microphone in the frame. I have USB microphones if I need them. I can record directly into a camera. I can record into something external like the Rodecaster Pro. But it's when I'm not filming indoors that I run into a lot of trouble. And I bring this up because I don't think I'm alone. Well, actually, I'm alone here in this room, but I don't think I'm alone in this situation. I think that there are probably a lot of people, maybe even you, who find themselves in a similar situation where in a controlled environment, you have no problem getting decent audio, but it's when you leave that controlled environment that then you lose control and struggle to find that balance between good audio and also a simple practical setup. So while the VideoMic NTG is still like one of my favorite microphones in terms of practicality, it sounds really good. It's much more affordable and instead of $360, this is about $200 now. It has some low cut filters and it also has some padding. So if you wanna take it down by like negative 20 decibels, you can do that. It even has safety channel recording. So your left and right channels will record at different levels. So if you accidentally clip one channel, you can use that safety channel. And of course it has the physical gain dial on the back, which is absolutely excellent. This is also a pretty big microphone. If I put these side by side here, I can take off this. If I put these side by side, there's quite a difference in size between these. So when they're on your camera, that definitely changes the size of your setup. But more importantly to me is how difficult it is to fit this in a camera bag. A lot of times what I end up doing is taking the microphone out and then putting this in part of the bag and then putting the mount in another part of the bag. But that means when it's time to set things up, I have to set up the microphone, which isn't super difficult, but it just takes time. And then I have to remember to grab the cable and connect the cable to the microphone and then connect the cable to the camera. And this cable drives me crazy because it's not really a big deal, but if you've had a camera that has this, you know that it can get kind of annoying to have this cable flipping around sometimes. Depending on which camera you're using, it might get in the way of the display. Fortunately, on the a7 IV and the a7S III, it doesn't get in the way of the display. But maybe more importantly is this cable is a potential failure point. So sometimes these cables can just go bad if they actually get pinched or messed up. But more often than not, Every once in a while things will get bumped and then it might not be in your camera all the way or it might not be in the microphone all the way and you don't know that until you're done filming and then all of your audio sounds really bad or you just didn't record any audio at all. Now, as I was talking about size between these microphones, like I mentioned, the Rhodes size, the biggest part of it comes from its shock mount. Same even on the VideoMic Go 2, which despite being half the price of this one, shockingly has the same shock mount pretty much, which is a really, really good one. 
This microphone will not pick up any vibration, any handling noise, any anything because it's in this really amazing shock mount that takes up a whole lot of space in your camera bag. The Sony mic, on the other hand, if you notice, it doesn't have that look, but it does have a shock mount. So if you can see here, I can kind of wiggle the base and push it in. And if you do that, you can feel that the microphone does have a shock mount system inside this housing, which works really well overall. However, one of the potential problems is that this opening for the mount, if you move it too much, this part can actually hit the edge of that. So if the microphone is shaking a lot, you could potentially have that sound be picked up in your audio. So right now, for example, I'm not moving the camera at all or I'm just bouncing a little bit and it should be picking up all that vibration. But if I shake the camera like crazy... Now, I honestly think that if your camera is shaking enough to make that a problem, you probably have bigger problems to worry about because you're like falling off of a roller coaster or something. So I don't really consider that a downside to the microphone, but it is something to be aware of that other traditional video mics like the VideoMic NTG have significantly better shock mounts than the Sony microphone does. Oh, and speaking of being able to put this in your bag easily, it actually comes with a little pouch that believe it or not is actually useful. So while this takes up a ton of space in your camera bag because you also don't wanna smash these things around, the Sony microphone comes with this little pouch. And of course you just put this in your bag, but it fits in here really nicely, even with the windscreen on. And then look at how well protected this is, but also how small this is. This can easily fit in like any pocket of your camera bag. It's basically just like a filter pouch. So with all of that being said, if you've got the budget for this microphone and you have a camera that's compatible with it and it's as awesome and wonderful as I'm saying it is, why wouldn't you want to get it? What is the catch? Well, there isn't really a catch with the microphone, but there is a catch with how easy it is or how not easy it is to actually get the microphone. This microphone is extremely hard to find in stock. And at the time I'm recording this video, it has been months and months, if not even most of the year at least, that it has been out of stock pretty much everywhere. For a while, I was even on a back order wait list for it, and the projected wait time was 10 to 12 months before getting the microphone. But it is still possible to find one. So what I did was a couple times a week, just whenever I would think about it, I would do a Google shopping search and just sort of open up every retailer that popped up. Now, some of the bigger ones like B&H Photo were pretty obvious, but there were a lot of smaller retailers too that I had never used before. And I ended up finding mine in stock after a few weeks of doing this at BNC Camera in Las Vegas. So I just wanted to say that BNC Camera Las Vegas is really awesome. So I placed my order and the microphone got to me in like less than 48 hours in brand new, perfect condition. And that was really cool because not only did I get the microphone I was looking for, but I actually found a new retailer that can be an option again in the future in these kinds of situations. So don't be afraid to branch out, but definitely check the reviews on retailers you don't normally use so that you don't get abused. And it's definitely worth keeping an eye out for these and seeing if they pop up at retailers from time to time so that you can get one because the ability to get great audio with very little effort is absolutely worth the investment. And speaking of things that are absolutely worth the investment, thank you to everyone who helped support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And if you still want to know more about video mics, check out these videos right here.